Okay, good afternoon. Oh, this fire feels like a reality show a little bit, uh, which is actually feels very much like home because I'm from the west coast of the United States. I live in Orange County, California, and the real housewives of Orange County are actually my neighbors, so, so I feel uh, this is very good. Uh, anyway, I'm excited to be here. I got here last night. Um, I, my flight arrived on time, but my uh, bags did not. So uh, I had the opportunity to buy this entire outfit last night. I hope you like it. It's, it's, it's native. It's Bulgarian. Everything is very original. Uh, you know, you got the show goes on, right? Bags will get here at some point. Uh, anyway, so uh, my colleague earlier had about 20 minutes to explain uh, quantum computing, which is a, that's a pretty a steep hill. Uh, I'm going to try to cover what is artificial intelligence and how it applies to the public and private sector in about 20 minutes. So I don't know which is harder, but uh, I'm going to do my best. So uh, you can see up here we have this little kung fu master on the screen. Uh, I'll get to why he's there a little bit later, but it, it is an important sub-theme to this broader conversation of the role of government and public and private sector working together to drive the adoption of AI. But let's, let's kind of get right into to it. Uh, so you know, artificial intelligence is, is this incredibly complicated topic that also can be explained in about 86,000 different ways. And that's one of the challenges. So I have one slide which is really intended to, to just project four key takeaways so that you can walk away, if nothing else, with the basic understanding of what it is and what it isn't. So let's start with number one. AI is just math, but is it? Right now, you see this picture here that, that's kind of a representation of sort of a classic uh, neural network. And, and really, if you peek under the hood, AI is really just math at an enormous scale. Okay? But when it happens at such a scale and such a complexity, it then has these emergent qualities. It does some things and it acts in ways that aren't completely predictable. And that's why you have this, un this explainability challenge with AI. And even the world's, really, the leading experts in AI and the professors and the data scientists that are creating all this math, they struggle to provide a single definition and they struggle to provide some of the explanations of how the systems are working. So this is part of the challenge. So I wouldn't over-index on what it is and what it isn't. I focus more on what it does, more on the outcomes. That's, a, that's, that's an easier way to focus. Now, the other thing about AI is that's a form of automation. In fact, it's the automation of automation, but not all forms of automation have AI. So this is the confusing part, right? So you have automation that, that focus, that's uh, powered by rules. You have a set of rules, you know, if this, then that. Go left, then right, then go right again, right? That's the, that's the rules-based automation we're familiar with. But AI doesn't just follow rules, AI learns. So AI is a form of automation, but there are many forms of automation that do not have AI. So if you're a company, if you're the CEO of a company and you want to pursue data science, or you want to pursue AI, or you want to pursue automation, frankly, those are different fields, but they all converge. And they all converge around this idea of transformation. So you may come at them from different areas, but they do come together from a business strategy perspective. Now, AI is also a little confusing because it's not a single discrete thing. AI is code. Right? I mean, at the end of the day, you're talking about software, but it's also a capability. So you may not want to learn how to code. You may not want to learn how to build a, a bot, but you might want to leverage that capability. And that's, and that's why you have to think of AI as more than just data, more than just data science. It is an opportunity to gain a strategic advantage using this new cutting edge technology. AI is also not IT, and this is the part which also can be very misleading for a lot of companies. They spend a lot of time in their technology department asking, how do we use AI, or go get us some AI, or let's implement AI. But this is the wrong language, because AI is not implemented. It is applied. And that word is very deliberate, and, it, and from that word cascades a lot of implications for your company and how you're going to treat it. So while IT is very predictable, and IT has decades of experience and protocols and knowledge and, and people really understand what it is and what it isn't, what the risks are and how to manage those risks, AI is still very much a science. Now, there's many aspects of AI that are maturing and becoming more industrial strength and they're starting to get adopted. But for the most part, it is a field of many fields and there's a lot of discovery and a lot of experimentation and a lot of lack of predictability, which doesn't look like IT at all. So a lot of the methods and the tools and the models that are applied to IT are dangerously out of touch with AI. And that's why you can't just toss this over the fence to your technology department and say, go get us some AI. That's what we need. That's not going to work very effectively today. That might be different 
10 years from now, but not today. And by the way, I have this little guy poking out from behind because uh, my, <laughs> the thing about AI is it's also not particularly sexy when it comes to demoing it. I mean, you know, AI is really mathematical models applied to scale to, to simulate or emulate human-like cognitive function. Now, that sounds cool, but on a screen, it's not that interesting. So usually people want to see a robot or a drone or some kind of machine. And if you don't do that, people don't get sort of super worked up about it. But the truth is... The vast majority of AI that's in our world, whether you see it or not, whether it's in the back office of your company, in your finance department, or it's in your car, or wherever it is, or maybe in your toaster, you know, it's, it's not actually that interesting to see. It's not going to look like a, a humanoid robot, but it'll still be quite interesting. Okay, so getting kind of, so that's, that's it for the 101 lesson. So that, that was about five minutes. So... Starting in 2016, something very interesting happened in this world. If you go back 30 months, just 30 months, there was not a country on earth that had a national AI strategy. That just wasn't a thing yet. And then suddenly, starting with Canada, it became a thing. And over the course of 2016, about a half dozen countries stepped up. By 2017, another 10 countries. And starting last year, it became a much bigger deal. Now, actually, I would give credit to this fellow here at the top, the founder and CEO of the World Economic Forum, who in January of that year released a report on the fourth industrial revolution. Now, he did not focus specifically or exclusively on AI, but that was a major theme. And he talked a lot about the impact, the growing impact of artificial intelligence as part of this broader convergence in driving this, this new industrial revolution. And frankly, I think that was a big push and a big sort of part of the awareness building because you know, only a few months after that, we started to see this trend pop. And then you see down below a picture of my friend, uh, the, the junior minister of, of digital and innovation and finance in Malta, uh, Sylvia Shembri, and, and he has been championing, along with his prime minister, the, the, you know, the, the role of AI in this small country and its importance in driving the future. And it really symbolizes this broader narrative. And we're going to be lucky that when I wrap up here in about 12 minutes, we're going to have Wayne from, from Malta, who's the chairman of the, of the National AI Task Force there. And we'll talk and learn a little bit more about what they're doing in that country. So when we, when we talk about the public sector, you got to understand, this is a big deal. This is everything. This is every facet of, of life, right? This is not just government. This is not just regulation, that, although that's a part of it. But this is, this is jobs and training and national security. This is about public health and, and justice and public safety. It's about the citizen experience. It's about access to services. There's really no part of the policy landscape or the government operations or ultimately your experience in your country that will not be affected by AI. So this will be very pervasive. And so the governments are really struggling with this, but they're also very excited. I mean, again, pretty much, you know, the top, right now we have about 35 or 40 countries in the world with national AI plans. There are what, 180 or 190 countries in the United Nations, right? There's still a lot of opportunity around the world for countries to catch up. This is going to be on the agenda for the next 10 years, at the very for the earliest. So then the question is, why are, why are the public and the private sector working together? I mean, why is this a big deal? And this is the reason. So the private sector, understandably, is focused on profitability and growth and margins and, and customer experience, right? This is what you care about. Whether you're a CEO of a small startup or a Fortune 1000 company, you, know, you, you have these set of issues. On the public sector side, you're worried about competitiveness on the national level. You worry about national security. You're, you're worried about the wellness of your population. Right? These are the issues that you worry about as a prime minister, as, as the president of your country. But these issues converge because AI... And, and actually, recently, uh, Bill Gates was quoted that, you know, referring to you know, artificial intelligence very, very much like, like nuclear technology, right? It's this dual-use technology. It's a general-purpose technology that can be applied across, broadly across society, but it, it's, it's as promising as it is dangerous, right? And so there are these really significant moral, human, ethical, social concerns now th that get raised by AI. Th these are not issues that you have with CRM. Right? No, no one's protesting the implementation of an ERP system. You know, cities and states and governments aren't passing rules because they're concerned about how mobile phones will violate human rights. Right? Th those things haven't happened, but they're happening around AI. 
right? So they come together. So you have a shared interest because governments, they want to defend against external threats, right? They want to promote their country. They want to increase the wellness and the health and the satisfaction of their, of their citizens. And companies want to attract the best talent. They want to attract investment, right? So they have this convergence of interests. And so what's very important is pretty much unlike anything else that we've seen in the past 100 years, governments and the private sector are collaborating around AI. And, they, and it's, it's, it's a must. It's not a convenience. So let's come back to, to the kung fu metaphor. So one of the more interesting conversations and narratives about AI, if you really want to get into what it is and what it isn't, is this ability for a, a machine, a system, a program, pick your favorite word, the ability for that machine to not just learn a skill, but to master it. And not just to master it, but to master it at superhuman speeds, and then to do it better than any human that ever has. The, this is some of the storylines you've seen come out in the last couple of years around gaming, right? And you've got a, there's a number of very good examples from the OpenAI forum and their, their focus on Dota 2 and Google and AlphaGo and its focus on the Go game. So you have a number of these examples, but what you see across all of them is that a system not only learned how to play a game, and it didn't just get good at it, it became the best player that ever lived anywhere. And in some cases, it did it in a matter of days. Sometimes it took months. Sometimes it's on its third or fourth sort of version, right? So they're getting better. But, but in some of these cases, it learned, mastered, and became essentially alien-like in its ability to play that game in four days. And so, that's, and so, so let's go back to Kung Fu. So Kung Fu is, you think about Kung Fu, uh, at least I do, right? And you, and you think of it as this Chinese martial art, right? And I actually took Pailam Kung Fu in college, and so you just think that's what that means. It's actually, that's sort of the popularized Western understanding. In Chinese, Kung Fu really refers to the ability to master a skill. It doesn't matter what the skill is. So you can be kung fu in the kitchen, you know, kung fu in the garden, you know, kung fu wherever. You know, kung fu is this ability to apply yourself and to become the best at anything. And so in effect, what AI is enabling us to do is to develop, to develop kung fu-like skills on anything. But instead of it taking a lifetime or eight years to get your black belt, these systems will master these skills in days, hours, and they will be better than anybody at anything. So this is, part of the, this is part of the unique opportunity. Let me give you a really profound example. So astrophysics is a hard field, you'd all agree, and I'm not an astrophysicist, really not at all, but, but, but I found this to be one of the most compelling examples of this concept of learning, mastering at unbelievable speeds. And, and, and you think if, if this could work for astrophysics, it could work for essentially anybody. Right? There's no conceit. I mean, this. I mean, astrophysics is up here, so pretty much everything else that we do is kind of below here, right? So, so check this out. The Einstein, many years, you know, when he was still around, theorized of this concept called a gravitational lens. And it's a very. Con I don't go into what it is, but you know, this idea of a gravitational lens is that essentially there's these smudges on, on an image. When, when we take pictures of the, of the universe, and you look at these smudges, and it's very important to understand if those smudges constitute what they call a gravitational lens, which is basically how light is bent as it goes through the universe and, and based on the gravitational force of certain celestial bodies. And that's very important because if you, if you identify these lenses, it changes the math of the cosmos. And so, so astrophysics spend many, many years studying these little smudges. And the way they do it, they do it through, through essentially a manual effort. They look down a little, little magnifying glasses and they pass these, these things around and they, they share them in the community. It's, you know, it's one of these things they do in, in a consensus. So a group of astrophysicists that are deeply trained will spend two weeks, two months, six months studying images to then maybe decide, hey, this is a gravitational lens. So this requires a lot of brain power across the world to make this one decision. And when they do it, then you know, that, that's it. They move on to the next one. So a group of, of, of scientists went to Stanford and said, you know, this feels like the kind of thing that maybe we could automate. And we're not worried about it replacing our jobs because, frankly, we'd rather not be caught up in this kind of analysis. We, we have other bigger problems to solve. But if you could help us solve this problem, maybe it could move things along. So 
they took all the knowledge on what a gravitational lens is and is not, and they trained the system. You know how long it took to train the system? Eight hours. You know how long it takes to become an astrophysicist with multiple degrees? You know, it's like several thousand hours, right, over many years, right? It took them one day to train this system. And that system learned, mastered, and now exceeds the human ability to identify gravitational lenses. And look at, this, look at the numbers, right? In a single day, it's all it took to train it. It can now do the equivalent of what humans can do in one-third of a second versus, say, six months. The net impact on the field of astrophysics is 10 to the seventh power, which is 10 million times faster. So if you're wondering why we're starting to see this wave of discoveries in astrophysics, new stars, new moons, new black holes, uh, new exoplanets, this is one of the reasons. All of that brain power, instead of being tied up, looking at these little smudges, they can move on and do more important things. Because this system can do what they do in that one analysis, and it can do it in a second or fraction of a second on something as powerful as a cell phone. So that's the kind of impact we're talking about. So if we come full circle, applying that impact across the world is clearly going to be a big deal, right? How you choose to focus it in your business or in your life, you know, will be interesting. But the countries around the world are clearly have, have latched onto this. And what they realize is it is changing not just data science, not just you know, online shopping, not just banking. It's changing the entire basis for competition, for how we value things, the definition of performance. It's going to change the formula for competition. So, you know, you might have picked up that across the world, there's sort of this global arms race. Unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of that word because it's starting to emphasize only the sort of defense aspect of it. And that's a big deal, too. And I don't want to downplay that, but that's not the only conversation to have. It's not about, this is not just about a global arms race. It's about a global embracement of artificial intelligence. And really, the rising tide rises all ships. And there will be many, many winners. Because you're not just talking about counting physical assets, right? You're talking about digital assets. And so big countries are investing more than little countries, for sure. But some of the smaller countries on Earth are going to lead in AI. Some of them already do. Canada is, is what, 10% population-wise, about 10% the size of the United States. It's a small country in terms of its size of a population and resources. But it is leading the world in the area of deep learning, which is, one, which is the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. So, you don't, so size isn't the most important thing when it comes to AI. It's going to be ingenuity and investment and other things. And you're going to have countries that lead in research and applications and in experiences and in machines and services. There's going to be many, many winners across this vast landscape. So that's the very exciting part about AI. I'm not sure there will be that many losers, frankly, but clearly the balance of power is definitely going to shift. Now, unfortunately, during my presentation, those TVs went out. <laughs> so I don't know <laughs> when we're running out of time. And I would like to, I would like to actually uh, uh, bring on my colleague, Wayne. Uh, I just don't know if, if now is the time to do that. So we could talk to someone who's at the very forefront of this uh, for a country. So can I ask the stage manager, are we ready to bring Wayne out? Because <laughs> there's, no, uh, there's no more monitors. Are we good? All right, so I would like to bring out, I don't, see the, I don't see any chairs, but I would like to bring out Wayne Grisky. Wayne is the Chief Technology Officer of the Malta Digital Innovation Authority and the Chairman of the National AI Task Force in Malta and has been helping and leading that country's effort to really take AI and infuse it across its economy, building on the success and their innovation around blockchain which they came out very early on and established themselves as the blockchain island. And I'll be honest, before I went to Malta two years ago, I didn't know much about the country. Uh, it's a beautiful country, not that far from here, uh, but they are doing amazing things. And what's so great about Malta is that even though it's a small country and has about 450,000 residents, right? So that's about the, the, the west side of Manhattan. You know, I mean, it's tiny, but, but they're... But that, does not, but that does not hold back their ability to think about all the innovative ways that they can apply AI 
to their government, to their citizens, to their private sector. And so we're going to talk to Wayne. So now that you've had this general presentation, let's, let's bring out Wayne and let's really understand how one country is doing it and, and listen to their journey and, and hopefully share some more specific lessons. Wayne, can you join me outside? Chairs. Yeah. I feel like I should get closer to you. I feel, feel yeah, like we're too, too far. <laughs> it's like it's one of those long dining rooms. Good okay. afternoon, Keith. All right. So, so uh, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, I got a yeah. little nervous at the end because I lost my monitor, so I wasn't sure okay. when to transition. But we got to, just like with my bags, it's just my, it's just not, it's just not my week for things. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm having a great time, and I'm really, I really appreciate you uh, making time out of your schedule and flying over here and, and joining me for this. I think it's so important that the world understand uh, the, how the public and the private sector are working together, how the public sector and, and government leaders like your prime minister and junior minister Shembri and others are, are, are taking this opportunity, not just, to, not just to talk about AI at conferences, frankly, but to actually roll up their sleeves yeah. and really make it uh, a serious commitment and that that will make a meaningful difference in the future of a country, and that it's really more than just uh, political talk, right? This is something. So I really hope that we can talk to the audience and share with them some of the meaningful things that we're doing together. But why don't we start, Wayne, and you can share a little bit about the journey that Malta's been on. Yeah, yeah. Um, good afternoon, first of all, Keith, and it's a pleasure being here on stage with you. Uh, a big well done to the organizers for this amazing stage as well. Um, uh, yes, so to give a little bit of a context before, before we, we, we delve into some of the details of, 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 our, of our policy and, and strategy. So last year, in, uh, in the beginning of summer, we enacted three laws in Parliament uh, regulating the blockchain space. Um, uh, and uh, we, we, we did that in a relatively short, short uh, period of time. But uh, we saw a niche where, where we, could, we, could make, we could make something, an eco build an, an ecosystem for, for companies that, that were speaking to us and telling us, listen, uh, we want something regulated, we want a space that is regulated so that we can operate and, and give peace of mind to, to our clients. So that was in the beginning of summer. And uh, one of the laws that we enacted um, is is uh, the one that creates my my authority, the Malta Digital Innovation Authority, which we then um, uh, launched in, in in October during the Delta Summit, which happened in, in Malta. And uh, when we were partying, that we launched the the MDIA, the Prime Minister told us that next year uh, he wants to see um, artificial intelligence as something that, that that will be rolled out and adopted in Malta. So we, we were seeing that, we, we saw that coming, but um, it was a little bit of a shock at the same time. Um, and then, uh, in a few weeks, um, uh, the, the junior minister, Honorable Shkembri, set up the task force, the National AI Task Force, which, which I, am, I am chairing. And together with me, um, uh, a number of people with brilliant minds, I say, I always say this, entrepreneurs, strategists, uh, lawyers, uh, academics, yep. and now also with the with the support of, of EY as well, and that and that uh, we have we have a brilliant team, I I, I say, and uh, the vision at the time was for Malta to become amongst the top ten countries in the world with the highest impact AI policy, and uh, I think we managed to do that in in, in a few months, I say, because um, uh, last last March. Um, uh, we, we organized a public workshop to publish our first um, AI, AI strategy, where, where our very proposition now is uh, for Malta to become the ultimate AI launchpad, where companies of, of any size, startups, um, established companies, micro-enterprises, SMEs, uh, can come to Malta, build their products, design their products, develop them, implement them, scale them. And when they're happy, they can springboard them. We're using the word springboarding. Springboard them to the world. Um, uh, 
Like, like you said earlier, Keith, um, AI is a general purpose technology which will impact many sectors within, within our, our society. And uh, from health to transport, to tourism, to education. And uh, so we didn't want uh, the strategy and the policy to be of the few, but of the many. Yeah. And uh, that's why we, we went out there in March and said, listen, the, these are the foundations of our policy, of our strategy. Now we want your feedback. We want to build this together. Uh, so let's take an example for, um, in the private sector. So the government can introduce incentives, policy measures. But at the end of the day, it's the private sector that needs to take them forward. Yeah. Uh, it's the private sector that needs to employ people to take these forward. So we see it as, as, a, as a key to, to involve all the stakeholders at design stage rather than after, after the implementation. And uh, as, as the, the foundations for our strategy, um, we are basing um, on three strategic pillars and three strategic enablers. The, the pillars, the verticals, are investment, startups, and innovation, um, which are, are, are key also to our, our economy. Um, and the public and private sector adoption, like, yes. like, like you were referring to earlier, Keith, as well. And uh, these are, are very much dependent on the enablers being the education, the workforce, the legal and the ethical framework, and the enabling infrastructure. So when you look at the objectives of, of, each, of each strategic pillar, um, you see that there is a, a, a direct dependency on these three, three four enablers. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. That's that's fantastic. You know, what, one of the questions that I sometimes get about about this topic is, you know, uh, besides tax policy and, and incentives, and and besides uh, making it easier, maybe helping attract foreign inv investment, that kind of thing. You know, what what are, what are the other compelling reasons why a government really needs to get involved? I mean, again, going back to this special nature of AI, and 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 two of the reasons uh, is that the the Investment, obviously you want that now, and startups want to have support now, but for the long-term success of a country and its competitiveness, uh, frankly, you need to invest in the young people, and you need to, frankly, even start educating them differently, right? And so one of the things I think is so great uh, about the, the Malta strategy is the very specific focus on looking at the curriculum of the country and saying, what can we do to make sure that not just the current entrepreneurs, but the future generations of of, of citizens and children are prepared for this new world. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So at the moment, we are a little bit lucky because we have full employment. The economy, the economy is, is, is doing well. Uh, but now we are focusing on the quality of life, um, the quality time you spend with your family, etc., etc. So um, uh, rather than focusing on, on just the tax incentives, we are also looking on how um, AI can help uh, with the impact on, on society. And in fact, um, in our, in our public, public um, adoption pillar, we, we are focusing on um, uh, identifying a number of use cases. And the criteria for these use cases is practically the social impact. So there has to be social impact. And uh, rather than just saying, listen, yes, these are the use cases, um, we're taking it a step further by saying three of those use cases need to be developed into projects so that in a couple of years' time, we can see um, uh, those applications of AI materialize. Yeah. Um, uh, and then going to the private sector again um, uh, and, and the education. So we have to take care of the younger ones and introduce AI at, a, at the young age. Um, uh, at the primary, at the secondary, at the university, all the different levels needs different attention. But also people which are already in, in employment, the workforce. So uh, we, we see that there will be a number of reskilling and upskilling. So um, we, we, we are looking at this holistically, basically. Yeah, oh, that's great. That's great. You know, the, the, the Regulation is, again, a very common uh, lever that the government has uh, to, to influence the economy. And there's always a balance in emerging technologies as to you know, 
how much to regulate, when to regulate. Yeah. You know, you want to create sort of, you, know, you want to create the opportunity to innovate. You don't want to regulate too fast. But since some of these technology also pose risks, you, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can use regulation as a positive. You can use regulation as a way to incentivize. Now, Malta has done that very successfully blockchain. What were some of the lessons you learned from that? Yeah, so one of the key principles that we wanted is uh, user protection and peace of mind. And uh, with that comes trust. So in order to, to um, uh, tell something, to adopt something, that someone needs to trust the, the technology. And yeah. therefore, our, our legal framework, our regulatory framework, is based on, on, on this kind of trust. So rather than regulating the technology, we are certifying it. So we are saying, listen, if, if there is a promoter, an owner of a product that is saying, listen, my software does this, this, and that, we are certifying that what he's actually saying is implemented in the code that the code is secure, that the management around the product and the application are, are, are fit, fit for purpose. The people themselves are fit for purpose. And, uh, and I think that's, that's something that is embraced both by the developers, the promoters, and also the users. And now we are seeing together with the development of the ethical framework um, to expand our regular framework from just DLT, smart contracts, and blockchain to also um, certain forms of AI. Um, because at the moment, um, as you know, Keith, we, we, we shied away a little bit from giving a definition for AI. Yes. Because it's complicated. You, you also said it earlier, <laughs> it's, it's too complicated. Yeah. Um, we're saying what for us isn't AI, um, not um, to instill fear, of, because a lot of people in Malta uh, still think that AI is just robots. Yeah. Uh, AI is, is, is machines that will, will take over the world. So, yeah. so we are trying to demystify yes. AI yes. and, and remove, remove the yeah. fear. But uh, for at the moment, we are still um, uh, um, not, not defining the AI. Because yeah. I prefer instead of giving a definition of AI, but going out there and say, listen, these are the applications That's right. That's of AI, right. Focus. rather than trying to, 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 to uh, teach and, and um, provide a definition of the technology. Yes. Now, staying on this regulatory theme for a moment, uh, you're right. Many people, and, and I don't want to accuse the media like it's one entity, but there, there are just these sort of sensationalist headlines, and I read everything on this topic, so I'm a good measurement of this issue, you know, there are too many since cinematic headlines and hysterical yeah. sort of notions of AI, sort of uh, very dystopian views of it's going to take over the world, uh, and, and certainly it's going to affect the workplace and, and, and things of that nature. But, but, but there is a very relevant conversation and, and an important conversation around the ethics of AI. Mm -hmm. and, and this is related, but not exactly the same as regulation. You, you might regulate for a variety of reasons, one of them might be the potential sort of uh, ethical implications, right? And, and this is, is a very interesting uh, challenge around the world because technology ethics is not a new conversation, but it's not. It's been kind of on the on the sidelines for a long time. AI has taken this. Uh, concept of ethics and really made it a very mainstream topic for the world and both governments and the biggest companies in the world are struggling to, they understand what AI ethics is. I don't think there's a lot of controversy over what is ethical or not ethical, although let's be very clear, this does vary regionally. There are, you know, your version of, of AI ethics will map to your values. Your values will reflect your perspective on the world and those values and perspectives do vary around the world. But in Western governments, Malta included, and, and the U.S., you know, there, there, there's a shared sense of values on human rights yeah. and privacy and other kinds of things. Uh, and and the, there's, there's opportunities that are amazing to apply AI that can run into those values in a way that can concern. Just yesterday, I'm from the great state of California, which while it's one state in the U.S., it's one of the largest economies in the world. So when California does something, it tends to generate a headline. Uh, and California tends to be very 
progressive on regulations. Uh, I don't happen to uh, totally agree with the latest headline, but there is, a, there is a law pending in California to essentially ban the use of facial recognition software mm. in, 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 for public safety purposes. That is, you know, not allow the police to apply facial recognition at scale. Uh, there are definitely concerns when done the wrong way, and, and there is the opportunity, unfortunately, to amplify human biases in a way that is not good. So there are concerns and there are legitimate reasons to do it you know, thoughtfully and slowly. On, on the same hand, uh, outright bans you know, can sometimes backfire. So on the issue of ethics, uh, where, where does Malta stand on this topic and how does it want to apply it internally? Yes, so uh, in the laws that we passed also last year, we have a provision for a National, a national Technology Ethics Committee is there, so now we need to create the mandate for that committee to start to start functioning. But the first point of call where we start it is uh, by looking at what the high-level expert group of the European Commission uh, was doing on ethics, the trustworthy AI um, ethical guidelines. And uh, there, there are a set of principles, like we said, based on values, um, definitions of what ethics means, the bias, explainable AI, etc. But also, the third section is on the assessment. And that's why earlier I said um, uh, that when you certify, I started with the ethical framework, and then the certification will be based on an assessment of what the software is doing, what the algorithm is doing in terms of, of those ethical guidelines. So, so yes, um, uh, we, are, we are very much looking at these guidelines so that we build on them. Um, and then, following that, we will also be looking at standards such as the standards that, are, that the IEEE is working on. So, but I know, because I had, I had some discussions also so with Katy from AI, yes. which is on the yes. board of IEEE, yeah. and uh, she told us that the standards will be published probably That's right next year. So I think we will be starting by basing our ethical framework on, on the high-level expert group recommendations, and then in the future take it forward to also include standards. And that will be part and parcel with our certification. Yeah. Um, uh, we are also looking at um, participating in, in uh, um, uh, test, test cases this summer. Mm -hmm. Um, on products that will be assessed against the, the ethical guidelines of, of the Commission. So that's something that we are also looking at. Yeah. And you know, it's just interesting because different, different countries and regions of the world are leading in different areas, and the European Union uh, is really leading on this narrative on this, yeah. around ethical, human centric, trustworthy, AI, trustworthy AI, socially yeah. aligned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's setting the bar for the world and providing a framework that it's going to be widely adopted. So yeah. the, the other thing that comes up in this conversation, and this is really true for public or private enterprises, it doesn't matter really if it's governments or entities, but you know, the, the AI is sort of advanced math, right? And before you can do advanced math, you have to learn basic math, right? Yeah. You work your way up. And this is true with, with, with the governments. And one of the things that I'm seeing around the world is that not every government, of course, is as advanced in their infrastructure, in their leadership, in their governance. Uh, you know, as it's, 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 it, it, of course, it depends on the country and where they are in their journey. And uh, Malta, uh, you know, has recently recognized the importance of making, you know, significant invest. It formed the Malta Digital Innovation Authority, for example, right, where you are. Uh, and it's also investing in the cloud and, and making a major push to move applications Into and data the to the cloud. Uh, so, I mean, just, is there anything you can comment on sort of that, the, the digital role and the maturity? Yes. In fact, modernization and digitalization is something that government is also um, championing. So through the Malta Information Technology Agency, um, uh, which I spent 17 years with, with the agency, um, is, is engaged in a project of modernization of all uh, government solutions. Um, uh, other than that, last year I was working on another project of a hybrid cloud solution where now government has a private public cloud solution for which government entities can, can also use. We are looking from the communications part um, with respect to 5G, for example. And Internet of Things, which initially um, uh, was going to be part of the strategy, but then we felt that it is more appropriate to be part of, of, of the infrastructure. 
And therefore, our, our objective when it comes to the enabling infrastructure is that we build a roadmap. Um, and in all the roadmaps, you have the as is situation. So at the moment, we are analyzing um, our, our infrastructure, including security as well, and, uh, and proposing how, how we're going to take this forward in order for, for the use cases that we will be identifying to be able to, to, uh, to work on, 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 our, on our infrastructure. So yes, I think from, yeah. from this aspect, we are quite advanced, but we still have to do Yeah, but you have your have roadmap, have and you're making yeah, those investments. Yeah. And as you said earlier, and we're, we're almost out of time, uh, you know, or as I, in my last slide, I said there will be many winners. And, I, and where I see Malta, uh, frankly, and some other countries is really pushing on that, the applied AI, yes. right? Not just research and thinking about it, but also putting it into action. And I think that's going to be very exciting for the citizens. Yeah. So we're out of time. I want to thank you for your, Wayne, thank thanks you for Pete. coming. Thank you. I want to thank Bulgaria for the close. And, and it was a great experience. And I think we have to, uh, it's time to yeah. exit the stage. So thank you again. That's good.